I can't really touch on that. So you have to go back to the last presentation I made to get caught up on that. I can comment on it though in the discussion later. Uh, just to get everybody uh, oriented on the terminology, we call this disease Huanglong Bing because it was found in China. And that's a mouthful, so it's HLB for short. And HLB is an acronym, and a lot of people don't like that, but it translates into yellow shoot disease, but it also translates into a disease called greening uh, that was discovered in South Africa, which is not exactly the same disease. So the more correct term is HLB. Uh, the more familiar term, maybe comfortable term, is greening. And there's a tree from South Florida that uh, shows you uh, about the crop loss in the kind of terms that I'm going to refer to a lot today. So, so uh, the task that Mark put before me is very, very wide and broad. It's seven years of history. Uh, if I seem like I'm going fast, uh, I am. And I do need to give you some introductory uh, background material so we all understand this disease at the same level before I launch into the comparison of what is going on in Brazil, Florida, and Texas so far. Uh, so uh, here we go. Uh, and if you're feeling a little anxious today and you wonder, you're wondering what's going on and, and where we're going, uh, you, you're here for the right reason then. Uh, you should feel anxious. Uh, what Yogi said, it's tough to make predictions about the future, and uh, especially about the future. And uh, you know, what I do know uh, is, is based on what I've experienced in Florida and what's ex been experienced elsewhere in the world. And that is three highly predictable things uh, have occurred. And, nursery, and citrus industries only survive where the nurseries have excluded the, the vector and excluded the disease, period. If they didn't, they, they, they didn't su survive, they failed, uh, they had to start over, they had to remove all the trees and begin over again, scorched earth and start all over again. Uh, the next thing I can tell you is that every uh, country in the Americas that has gotten HLB have gotten it from their neighbor within five years. And the current examples are here, Texas and California, being in proximity to Mexico. And then uh, just uh, the other day, I learned that confirmation has been made of uh, the disease in Argentina, which is right next to Brazil. Third thing is that in each area where HLB was established, uh, the cost of producing citrus uh, went to a level that was unprecedented. The damage that was caused by the disease uh, was never uh, experienced before that by any other disease. So this is an unprecedented uh, disease. Uh, it's a devastating disease. There is no exaggerating this disease's impact on these industries. So I'm going to talk about that impact in Florida. And uh, I think you need to know uh, all the facts and, and all the uh, interpretations of it as best as I know. Uh, but you all need to know the background of this pathogen, and that is that it's uh, highly fastidious. You can't grow it in culture, so it's a real uh, bear to try to work with as a scientist. There's lots of evidence that it is the cause of HLB, so there's no question about this. You're controlling a bacterium that is transmitted by a vector, and it's phloem limited. It's in the phloem. It's moving up and down the tree very, very freely, uh, much more freely than we thought. Uh, so. So I'm going to tell you some things about the disease you maybe haven't heard before that I've learned just in the last uh, six months. It's both graft transmissible and insect transmissible. And that's important because those are both the major things you do in, in, in nurseries. You do a lot of grafting and you have to deal with insects and excluding them uh, or controlling them in nurseries. And there's only one way to exclude the vector and that is with the enclosed nursery type of approach. The terminology, because this thing is not culturable, you can't do all the traditional methods to show it is the cause. In other words, grow it in a culture plate, and, uh, inoculate plants, and, and get the disease to reproduce itself. So you have this very funny terminology, but let's just say that uh, it's uh, LAS. Uh, Lepidobacter asiaticus uh, is the pathogen we have here in Texas, we have in California, and we had, have in Florida and all the rest of the Americas just about that grow citrus now have this uh, form of the disease. In other places, as in Brazil, they have another uh, pathogen called Americanus. Uh, Americanus is something a little different from Asiaticus. It's more uh, cool, uh, climate, climate uh, adapted, which sounds funny. It probably came from China originally, uh, 
whereas Asiaticus is a warm climate adaptive pathogen, but it also can produce symptoms in cool climates. And then you have this cool climate pathogen called Africanus, which is really the correct way to refer to the disease there as greening, uh, as greening in South Africa and, and the rest of uh, Africa as, as well, where they have cooler climate. But again, we have Liberobacter asiaticus, so we call that LAS for short. The distribution of this disease uh, is spreading all through the Americas, and uh, let's see, where is the laser here? Uh, the, the top, top button, the little red. The little red one. Okay, so all the Americas now, you see in the, it's sort of light purple or dark purple, either have the vector, or have the disease, that's the dark purple. Here's Asia. The dark purple shows that it's all across the uh, mid -Ameri mid Middle uh, Americas and, and the southern part of the United States now and all the citrus producing states. Uh, I'm not sure about Arizona, but I think all the others are positive now for HLV as well as the vector. So this thing has taken over the Americas in the last, uh, since 2004 it was discovered in uh, Brazil. And so it, it is a very invasive disease at the moment. And uh, we can get into the whys and wherefores for that, but basically it's proximity to the, the, the country next door that has the disease and, the vector, and or the vector. Okay, let's go the right way here. Uh, there's a misunderstanding about this disease. There's a lot of symptoms associated with the disease that make it difficult to identify in the field. And so, there's been this misunderstanding in Florida that it's uh, nutrient deficiency symptoms that uh, represent this disease's impact on the tree, and, and that's not correct. Uh, the basic uh, disease symptom is modeling of the leaves and misshapen and, and poor development of the fruit, uh, dieback of the tree. This is all due to a dysfunction of the phloem, the sugar conducting system. This is all disruption of uh, how, how the tree makes uh, photosynthate and how it uh, translocates it in the tree. The lesion in the tree is actually a necrosis of the phloem, the conducting system. So the uh, main uh, type of symptoms here, this yellowing and modeling of leaves and shoots that we talk about, dieback of shoots, is due to uh, carbohydrate disruption, starvation, uh, lack of uh, production. So all this is due to carbohydrate disruption, not nutritional uh, deficiency. So get that straight from the beginning. Nutrition, the well, deficiency is a byproduct of all this dysfunction. It's not the thing that starts the process of all these symptoms developing. So this uh, lack of carbohydrate leads to uh, shedding of plant part, foliation, uh, premature fruit drop, twig, twig dieback. Those are all symptoms of carbohydrate. Uh, starvation, lack of production, lack of support of leaves and fruit. Poorly developed root system, uh, it, it's more like root system is dying back when it gets infected by this pathogen, uh, is, is a symptom that we weren't so aware of until recently. This loss of roots is, is, is very, very significant, 30% in trees in the early stages of decline. So even before you see tree decline symptoms above the ground, you've got 30% root loss. The more obvious thing and a very good field character is the Lopsided misshapen fruit, if you cut these fruit open, you see aborted seed. That's the only characteristic of this disease. Excessive fruit drop I talked about is uh, what unfortunately you see right before the crop is harvested because again, the fruit are starving. They're not getting the carbohydrate they need to support the uh, fruit uh, retention on the tree. Abnormal. Before you cut that slide up, do you mind commenting on which of these symptoms you see first? Because I, you know, where we are in Texas here, we're, we're needing to look for the earlier symptoms yeah. Can you just kind of compare those a little bit in terms of when they show up? The ones I underline there are the, these symptoms that you need to identify. They are present all year long. Mike Irie in the uh, lab there in Florida, the U.S. Sugar Lab, uh, shows that the yellowing and modeling uh, having to do with this carbohydrate starvation in leaves is a symptom that's present all season long to a greater or lesser extent. That is the cardinal symptom. The other cardinal symptom is this uh, Misshapen fruit, I'll show you, has aborted seeds. If you can cut a fruit open and see aborted seeds, that is not caused by any other disease, any other dysfunction in the tree. So that is a smoking gun symptom. Uh, less obvious is the off-flavored juice uh, in these fruit. When you cut these fruit open and taste them, they, they don't taste right. Uh, some people think they taste salty, some 
taste acid, sour. I mean, that, that taste varies depending on the person doing the taste. But the off-flavor juice has tremendous implications for not only processed, but for fresh fruit as well. As these uh, trees get sicker, there are more fruit that are uh, having this off-flavor. Again. Yeah. Yes. Um, I don't know if it's too early to say this, but with the death of infections, the symptom from you uh, I'll, time. I'll cover that, Manny. Okay. Uh, and, and I can't take too many questions if I'm going to stay on time. I, I think we need to save the questions to last. Is that okay, Mark? That's perfect. Uh, I mean, I, I appreciate that we need to really emphasize some things, but uh, if I don't get through this, uh, I'm going to keep us waiting here. This is the modeling on the leaves. That is, again, the, the cardinal symptom of the disease. It's carbohydrate disruption due to chloroplast bursting and starch, from starch accumulation in the chloroplasts. And those bursted uh, chloroplasts cause these yellow spots. Uh, you can also see these green islands uh, here, down here. This is the common symptom modeling. This is the green island. This is less common. This is the yellow shoot here. Notice the background here is a dark green, well-nutrition tree, but the shoot comes out, it's yellow, so hence the disease name in, in uh, Chinese. And then you have this uh, deterioration of the tree, de decline of the tree to, uh, in, in the form of leaf and fruit drop. It can occur after freezes here in a very, very dramatic way. Uh, this is due to the stresses uh, brought on by freezes and the lack of uh, ability of the tree to uh, cope with the stress. More symptoms, you sometimes you get a necrosis of the, of, the, uh, of the veins, the major veins. Uh, sometimes you see this hot, what we call a hot sink symptom associated. This is where you get confusion about nutritional symptoms and those being primary, but these are all secondary symptoms here, iron chlorosis. And here's something that's also present very often in leaves, but is confusing for you to use here in uh, Texas is yellow vein chlorosis is also caused by uh, phytophthora damage to roots. Uh, phytophthora root rot causes yellow vein. So this is not a good symptom for you to depend on here in uh, Texas or anywhere for that matter. The modeling is the symptom you must identify if you're doing survey. Misshapen fruit uh, also showing here that the fruit have this sort of a, a gumming at the uh, peduncle end of the fruit here. <laughs> That gumming and this misshapen is somewhat diagnostic, but even better is this abortion of, of the seeds here. And of course, a reduction in fruit size, other things cause that. But this uh, inversion of the uh, coloration, orange on the top, green on the bottom, is also a symptom, but not always present on these uh, misshapen fruit. Here's the really bad news, and that is varietal resistance does not exist in uh, citrus or near relatives. So there aren't any uh, sources of resistance that we can bring in that are readily, readily obvious or readily available in, in citrus and near relatives. Uh, bad news is that sweet oranges are the most affected. Better news is that grapefruit is not affected as, as, as readily, uh, rapidly, but the symptoms develop uh, just as severe on, on these varieties as it does on these varieties. It just takes longer. Uh, so tolerance is, is more like it takes longer for uh, the most severe symptoms to develop over time. And then uh, there is this uh, tolerance or resi maybe resistance in Ponsiris and Citrangus. Uh, the titer, the bacterial growth in Ponsiris is very low compared to other varieties. So how we define tolerance is, is a little bit uncertain right now because all these varieties show some symptoms when they're inoculated in the greenhouse. But just to make it clear and, and to address your uh, question, Manny, is that uh, grapefruit <laughs> does go to the, uh, you know, the acute stage of decline and, and, and fruit loss, uh, fruit drop, and the symptoms are typical of the HLB on other varieties. They just take a little bit longer to manifest themselves. So don't be lulled into thinking because you're not seeing the disease progress in the grapefruit growth or you've seen the outbreak as much uh, progress as you did in the sweet orange grove that you've got a lesser impact because you're grapefruit here in uh, Texas. Uh, that, is, that would be an uh, underestimation of the disease. It just, uh, it's the same disease, it just takes a little bit longer for all this to, to develop over time. 
Okay, so the bottom line, no, no, no sources of resistance in citrus is, is really, a, uh, you know, the most devastating part about this disease that you can't move to other varieties, other rootstocks to get away from its impacts like you can with other diseases of citrus. The other uh, really unfortunate thing is that we have a typhoid mary here, Mariah, that's grown as an ornamental that's really moved this disease around and done a lot of bad uh, uh, things in terms of spreading the disease because it's basically if not an asymptomatic host, a low symptomatic host, doesn't affect its growth very much. And as it's moved as an ornamental, so what if it's a little bit yellow? Uh, so this, this particular uh, host of both the vector and the pathogen has been a very devastating uh, uh, thing for uh, both here in, well, in Florida and, and down in Brazil as well. Graft transmission, I've talked about, is transmissible by uh, budwood. But that's variable because the bacterial distribution in the shoot is, is uneven. In the roots, we find it to be much more uniform in distribution. So that's why the uh, transmission by budwood is variable. Uh, and that's kind of a, a devil for us. We'd like to inoculate plants in the greenhouse, but because of this variability, we're kind of defeated in getting very good transmission uh, with budwood or buds. Insect transmission is, is uh, the way it spreads in the field. Uh, it's uh, something that uh, can occur very readily depending on the titer of the bacterium in the, in the insect, the stage that the insect uh, acquires the bacterium, whether it's in the nymphal stage where it's almost positively going to get infected, or the adult stage and it visits a tree that's infected and acquires the, the bacterium. It depends on just how, what percentage of these insects are positive out there in the, in the field. There's no evidence for seed transmission. There's Four good studies, including our own, that showed no uh, support for seed transmission. So the good news is that if you're using uh, seed that is it out, grown outdoors, seed trees that are grown outdoors, they don't represent a risk. Obviously, you don't want to use trees that have uh, HLV symptoms and HLV-affected fruit because, the, you know, as I said, the seed abort. You want to use healthy, healthy uh, trees and fruit to extract the seed. Uh, but no evidence for seed transmission is, is a very good piece of news for nursery. The vector is Diaphorina citri, uh, that's the one for Asian uh, HLV, for the African HLV it's this Triosa eritrea. That is not in the uh, western hemisphere so we're not really dealing with that vector but certainly this, this one here is a very well adapted vector to many many different environmental conditions, uh, climatic conditions. Very quickly what happened in Florida. Uh, it was discovered in 2005 in Florida, in uh, Dade County in the south. My pointer is not working at the moment. Uh, but in the south here is where it was first discovered. Here we go. Then as they surveyed up the east coast, uh, that's these lines here. They surveyed every five miles. They found it all the way up to Fort Pierce. So already that uh, disease had spread up the east coast. And I think that that was Mariah uh, nursery stock that was moved down here in this Dade County area up the coast uh, as an ornamental. So not as a citrus movement, but as an ornamental movement. This disease was already well established on the East Coast right from the very beginning. So we started out at a very uh, bad place uh, at a very great disadvantage because not too long after it was discovered bridging into growth along here, bridging across this area, across the Everglades here, probably by sibling movement. It was discovered in the south of the industry almost as soon after uh, its discovery down here in, in late 2005. So we started out in a very uh, disadvantaged situation and it didn't take long, 2007, before all the main citrus producing uh, counties were positive. Now all the counties in Florida are positive at the present. So it moved very, very quickly because of this uh, distribution of the disease, of the pathogen up the east coast by ornamentals. So the HLV management uh, paradigm was mentioned by, by John uh, DeGrasse, and you just can't repeat it enough times that there are major recommendations that these countries have used to deal with this in Asia and Brazil. Isolation of the budwood sources, uh, geographically best situation, get it out of the industry, Short of that, you put it under screen, you keep it under very uh, secure uh, conditions to exclude the vector and the pathogen. 
isolation of nursery production the same. Uh, it would be nice if we could put nurseries out of the citrus area. Feasible, not very economical. So that isolation turned out to be usually, uh, again, screened. Uh, requirement that all nursery be produced, all nursery stock be produced in insect resistant greenhouses is absolutely required, and there's a lot of other uh, elements of a greenhouse structure uh, it, to uh, achieve that that will be talked about by some of the speakers that follow. Uh, control of the vector in the field uh, goes without saying. You've already started doing that back in 2009, well before HLB was even found here. And removal of infected trees to reduce inoculum is, uh, it works. Uh, it works under certain Advan advantageous conditions. It doesn't work under others, depending on how much inoculum is in the neighborhood. But, but this, is, uh, this is a paradigm that works. It has uh, controlled the disease in Brazil. It has controlled the disease in Asia. There's no question about this removal of inoculum it is important and, and, and part of this process that must be, a, must be uh, accomplished to uh, achieve disease control. Okay, a little bit about this committee. It's already been mentioned that we had this committee in Florida called the Citrus Plant Protection Committee. Uh, I chaired it. Uh, I put it together with Phil Rux, uh, one of the leading nurserymen. We had six nurserymen and six production managers on this committee. It was a voting type of uh, structure where majority ruled, uh, so we voted on each of these issues ultimately. There was ad hoc membership by uh, myself from UF and other experts on the psyllids. Uh, FDAX, DPI, that's our uh, regulatory agency in Florida, and then USDA APHIS, the federal. These were ex officio members of the committee. They sat there and listened to what we were talking about. We met eight times from October to March, so we, we moved fast, but we moved slow in the sense that we had to get a lot of meetings under our belt to get a lot of the decisions made that have already been made here in uh, Texas after uh, one or two meetings. So the good news is, is that we kind of charted the, the course for Texas, and they're following behind and I think making very good decisions in the process. And the goal here is to formulate new nursery, uh, is to formulate the guidelines that can be adopted as new nursery regulations. So what did that committee do? Uh, we did a lot of things. We evaluated the, the risk of locating nurseries within the, the industry, the need for windbreaks to mitigate exposure to inoculum. Uh, of course, greenhouse structures, how they should be uh, built, uh, what kind of things need to be included in those structures in terms of excluding, to exclude the vector. Uh, sanitation measures to maintain this uh, clean environment were important, and we talked a lot about those. Uh, we assessed the benefits and cost of these different management options. They're all expensive, but uh, there are ways of economizing on some of these things that had to be, we had to work through because uh, you can't all build a Cadillac nursery to replace the one that you have. So. There are varying levels of ways to achieve uh, the goals of this uh, uh, making greenhouse structures uh, able to exclude the vector and the disease. And then the recommendations that we made were incorporated in the uh, state F FDAX, Department of Agriculture, Division of Plant Industries uh, process that they took to the legislature then, and they stayed in very close communication with us the whole way through uh, the process. So the, the recommendations were uh, the ones that uh, were eventually adopted in whole, just about in whole. Uh, our committee said new nurseries should be located away from commercial and residential citrus as much as possible, but it's okay for the existing nurseries to stay in their, their sites. They could be grandfathered in. That was an important criteria. That meant that nurseries didn't have to completely start over. Uh, the nurseries that uh, did decide to relocate have mostly located out of the citrus area. But for the most part, the majority of the nurseries stayed in the citrus zone and stayed in the existing sites. They were producing uh, citrus in uh, before that uh, in an open or less uh, enclosed nursery. Uh, the other important thing is that the dooryard and commercial nursery standards had to be the same. There's no double standards in, in Florida. Uh, it was always discussed from the beginning that everybody would be treated the same. Uh, the requirement for the uh, Insect resistant greenhouses, double door entry, etc., will be talked about in detail after me, and so I won't get into the, uh, you know, the finer points of that. We had to establish a time point at which you could no longer sell the uh, the old exposed trees, and that you would move to the new uh, 
and closed tree production uh, availability. And that date was set uh, for January 2008. That was a year and a half after this process started. That same goal has been set here in uh, Texas. Uh, September 2013 is about uh, a year and a half after the uh, discovery of the disease. And I think that's a, that's a very uh, worthy uh, goal to set and, and one I hope that you can attain here in, in uh, Texas. Then the other important thing is that you have to support all this with monthly ins with inspection. Now we, we chose monthly inspections and that's what the Division of Plant Industry accepted. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be monthly inspections but there has to be a, a inspection structure to back all this up to, to, to make it work. If you don't have that uh, it's not going not to succeed. Okay, very quickly, the timeline was 2007, new nursery regulations took effect. That's called uh, Rule 5B-62. Uh, several uh, workshops and drafts were, were gone through in that process before it went to the legislature and got uh, put into law. Uh, 2007, uh, DPI started the inspections on 30-day cycles. That's, a, again, a very important part of the piece of this whole process. 2007, DPI uh, greenhouse facility was completed north of the citrus belt in a place called Chiefland. And again, the, uh, the dead drop date for the old uh, production trees was uh, December 31st, 2007, and the new production trees had to be uh, uh, the only thing available uh, after January 1, 2008. And the first commercial budwood was cut from their uh, uh, foundation and increased uh, house there in Chiefland on January 10th, 2008. So, so we moved fast and uh, I think uh, if effectively to toward this situation that you're, you're, you're heading here toward in uh, Texas that uh, Mark talked about. So you're making good progress toward these goals as well. So HOB free budwood and nursery propagation is the, is the foundation and the Florida budwood uh, certification program uh, guarantees that by testing for HLB uh, once a year. Uh, they test the budwood source houses in not only their own uh, budwood production system, but also in nursery production systems. They'll test that. Uh, uh, private labs, commercial labs will test that as well for, for nurserymen that have their own budwood. All this is monitored again on about a, a yearly basis. Uh, so uh, the good news is, is that all the budwood that was tested initially in the process in 2006, 2007 was clean. So we started off clean, we've stayed clean, and uh, so all the, all the uh, effort has succeeded in keeping things completely free of HLB. Uh, all nursery trees must be propagated in HLB tested, uh, from HLB tested sources in insect proof greenhouses. That's the, the goal. That's the, 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 again, the proof is that that's working very well, and psyllid incursions in the nurseries uh, have been few, and there has been no reports of HLB in any of our nurseries uh, either, so we're, we're staying clean. Uh, the nurseries had to develop new infrastructure. Most chose to stay where they were uh, put before, and uh, they had to be, if they were locating in new locations, at least one mile from a citrus planting, that's kind of tough in the citrus belt in Florida. Actually, it's kind of tough anywhere in Florida to be more than a mile from any citrus, both residential and commercial. So you have to get a long way north before you're actually more than a mile away from citrus. So the criteria of having uh, inoculum distant from your nursery is a desirable one, but not necessarily a very achievable one. And I would guess the same would be here in the valley. Same uh, situation would be true for here, here in the valley. Here's one of those nurseries uh, that was uh, built by about 2008, right about the time of the uh, rule changes. Uh, this is uh, the biggest and most modern uh, technologically advanced nursery in Florida. It's Phil Rux's nursery. Uh, nurseries don't all have to be like this to uh, succeed in meeting the uh, regulations, so I'm not implying that you need to build nurseries like this, but uh, this is a nursery that re represents kind of the state of the art, I would say, of nursery production uh, here in Florida and actually across the, the world. Uh, a little bit about managing HLB in Brazil and how that proceeds with the, what I call the traditional management uh, is that uh, intensive growth surveys are very important. Uh, backbone of this. Uh, they survey four to six times a year. Uh, 
uh, infected trees are moved very soon after discovery, 15 days, uh, sometimes shorter, sometimes longer. Intensive spray programs uh, that you've heard about uh, in Brazil are true. They spray up to 30 times in some cases, but on more, more so on the average, uh, somewhere around 8 to 10 times. Uh, sometimes uh, these programs uh, using uh, psyllid surveillance would, would find one psyllid and then go ahead and initiate a spray. So you can have sprays being initiated as frequently as every 14 days during the growing season. The concern is with all this uh, psyllid control with uh, different pesticides that uh, you're going to get resistance and there is some evidence in Florida that this is uh, starting to build up in certain uh, active ingredients. Okay, Serbian detection uh, had to be backstopped by uh, <coughs> testing of the, of the uh, samples for the growers. The growers can't immediately identify these symptoms, so they send these, sim these samples to uh, a lab that was opened by Southern Garden Citrus that we supported as a cooperator, and this allowed growers to uh, develop uh, the confidence to go out and diagnose the disease uh, based on visual symptoms. So we started with a lot of HOB testing to backstop uh, whether these uh, symptoms that they were observing in the groves were HLB or not. Uh, those reports were made back to uh, not, not only the grower confidentially, but also to the uh, Department of Agriculture and the USDA APHIS uh, uh, regulatory groups that maintain the databases uh, to track the uh, discovery of this uh, bacterium in each new county. They had to have some follow-up testing by those agencies to uh, confirm those samples. But uh, this did a lot, this gave us a, a really good head start on testing not only the uh, grower samples, but also the budwood samples in the, in the nurseries and the uh, budwood program. Okay, here's the, here's the kicker, is that the production costs when you have HLB double. And the reason for that is that there are less trees produced in this new nursery system, at least initially and there's increased demand and cost for these trees because of the way they're produced and because of the uh, situation here with removal of trees, you're creating a, a demand for trees that, that does stress the uh, nursery production uh, system and, and Nate maybe can comment on that later. Uh, there's of course increased chemical cost for controlling the psyllid and in Florida we're using the enhanced nutrient program called ENPs for short uh, to sustain the productivity of trees. These are quite uh, expensive programs. So all, all in all, uh, the management costs with HLB double. That's a real kicker. Um, this blue area here is a 14,000 acre farm in Brazil. This is to show uh, the what we call the bad neighbor effect. Uh, this red line around the outside uh, defines an area that they spray their neighbors, actually spray two kilometers around the entire area. And they've learned that they had to do this to, to control their neighbor's psyllids, not to control their psyllids, but to control their neighbor's psyllids coming in with inoculum, as inoculum, primary inoculum from these hundred odd properties around. Now many of these properties have been encouraged by this company, Cambui, to stop growing citrus and I want to show you the uh, manifest benefits of that. They've been fighting this uh, with the traditional management of scouting and removing trees for the last uh, 12 year, or seven years from 2005 to 2012. And you know, they've gone through a rough patch here all the way up to 5% uh, in one year of loss uh, of trees or removal of trees here. Again, this pointer is not working for some reason. It's on and off. But anyway, in May of in May, April of 2011, they had removed uh, almost 5% of the trees in that year. Since they've convinced neighbors to, to uh, remove their citrus, convert to sugar cane, uh, get out of citrus, the uh, incidence has gone right back down to where it started from in 2005, 2006. So the good news is, if you control your neighbor's inoculum, you can uh, very well succeed with the scouting and removing process. You can even succeed with bad neighbors, but uh, it's a rough go. Uh, in this case, it was economically sustainable for this company to continue this program, and they stuck with it. But it's a lot of work, and it, it's difficult to, uh, to manage the disease with bad neighbors surrounding. So the impacts on our and uh, Brazilian industries are uh, the same. It doesn't matter whether you're in Florida or Brazil. These uh, fit uh, exactly the same for each case. Uh, tree production losses are 30 to 60 percent, as measured by uh, 
uh, a very good uh, research study. And eventually trees do die. There is tree mortality, particularly if they're under stress. I've talked about the reduced uh, fruit quality having to do with taste, but there's a redu reduction in quantity. Pound solids of the fruit that are on the tree is reduced. Uh, there's these increased costs in the form of silic control, removal of trees. That's mostly Brazil now as they're removing trees uh, more so than we are. Uh, increased production costs due to enhanced nutritional programs, which we're using in large part, but Brazil is not. Increased replanting costs due to the removal of trees and loss of trees and disease. And the increased cost and reduced availability of nursery trees that, again, uh, Nate will probably refer to more in more detail. Now, very quickly, uh, just what kind of impacts do we see in Florida currently in what I'll call the worst case? These are young trees, three-year-old Hamlin, four-year-old uh, Valencia groves on Swingle. And we're looking at the number of trees in these blocks. This is 2,500 trees in each block that were surveyed. And literally 80% of the trees in each block were PCR positive. They were either pre-symptomatic or symptomatic, but they were 80% PCR positive trees. This red uh, uh, row here uh, indicates where uh, the trees that are pre-symptomatic uh, are, are, are following in this uh, set of uh, things we measured. About 30% of the trees are pre-symptomatic, that is PCR positive, but symptomatic negative. You look at those trees' root weight and root loss, there's already 30% root loss on these trees before you see any symptoms above the ground. So this disease is, is very insidious and very devastating even before you see symptoms. Uh, so, so you'd say, well, why bother to remove them if they're already that sick? Uh, I mean, or why bother to even continue pr trying to make them, pr uh, try, trying to, uh, you know, produce fruit with these trees. At three and four years, you don't, you don't produce tr uh, fruit any longer. They're basically out of production already. So this is worst case, 80% infection of the whole grove and 30% fibrous root loss before canopy symptoms. Uh, this is looking at our future. I think this is not necessarily the present. This is solid blocks of trees that have been planted since the HLV inoculum got very, very high.